Hey guys, Meredith here, back with another GED Think Aloud. This time we're going to take a look at reasoning through language arts, RLA, which is just the, the reading portion of the GED. So let's get started. Now, the big thing to notice on the RLA test um, is all these pages at the top here. So a lot of these readings are not one page. The, this one in particular is five. You have to read all five of them or you will not be able to understand the entire reading. So don't forget to look for these page tabs at the top of the readings. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you I've already read this. Anytime you get a reading, you're going to do a couple of things. The first one is you're going to look at the title of the reading, Lessons on the Savannah. So this sounds like a story where they're teaching some lessons. Someone is learning something new. So I've already read this. If you need to, check out the website, read it for yourself. But for the sake of time, we're going to skip through the whole reading it out loud part and jump straight to the questions. But it is important that you do read all of the reading before you get to the questions. So let's take a look. Number one, which quotation from the passage supports the idea that Supit is teaching the narrator a skill that requires patience? So that word patience jumps out to me. So we need to know how, how or how do we know that he is using patience or needing patience? So let's take a look at the answers. Letter A, I will be too busy to drink. Well, being busy, I'm not sure that has anything to do with patience. In fact, it might be the opposite. So I don't think it's letter A. Letter B, each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Well, that idea of being very slow. If you're learning something new and you need a lot of patience, you might move a little bit slow. So I, I like that one, let's keep it. Letter C, uh, when we were boys, we practiced with rhinoceroses when they were asleep. Um, interesting sentence, not sure it connects to patients. I don't, I don't see a connection there, talking about the rhinoceroses. Letter D, the tribe taught me to stalk many other animals. Um, also a sentence that's true, it's from the reading, but again, it needs to connect to the question about patients. So yes, that's the lesson being taught, but it doesn't tell me how patience is used or required. So that leaves us with just letter B. And if we take a look at page three here, it does get into it. Uh, let me get my highlighter here. So each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Sometimes he froze mid-step. He even talks at the beginning, for several minutes he stood perfectly still. So this hunt does require a lot of patience so that you don't scare the animals. So that makes sense that letter B would be the correct answer. And we can check our answer here, and it is letter B. Question two, still the same reading. Which fact can the reader infer about the narrator? Now this word infer, or you might hear inferences, means to make a guess. Now it's not a random guess, it's an educated guess. Using common sense, what we know, and combining it with what we read. So what can we infer about the narrator? A, he is experienced with working with animals. Now the word experienced, that kind of seems like the opposite of what I read. Because remember the title, lessons, he's learning. He is being taught because he doesn't have experience. So I don't think that the answer for A is correct. Letter B, he is in a hurry to reach his next destination. Well, that word hurry, um, we already said that he needs patience. And in fact, the very first sentence says, I'm not so worried about time anymore. So I don't think, I don't think he's rushing through a lot of this. So let's mark out B. Letter C, he was nervous about traveling in the savannah. That one might be true. Um, it is a new place for him. He's learning about it. So let's leave it and we'll come back. Letter D, he was raised in the city rather than in the wilderness. So the idea of the city. So let's take a look at the reading and see if we can find, is it A or is it C or D? Which one is a better answer? So if we look at page three here, or actually let's look at page four. 
So look at this one. It talks about New York City. And my parents used to worry about some of the things my friends and I did in New York City. Well, that sounds like he's not from this area, that he's not from the wilderness. He's from an urban area. He's from the city. So that's why I do think that our answer is going to be letter D. He might be nervous because he's from the city, but D is more specific that we can definitely say for sure that it's true, that we can make that guess when he mentions New York City here. So let's check our answer. And we are correct, it is D. All right, question three. Which definition best matches the use of the word occupied in paragraph 16? So we need to find a definition for occupied and it tells us where to look. We don't need to read this whole thing again. Let's look at paragraph 16 right here. And let's see if we can find the word occupied in the sentence or in the paragraph right here. I could, if in fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously occupied. So remember, the guide is moving very slowly so he doesn't scare the animals. So the narrator can only tell that he's moving because he's not in the spot he previously occupied. So what does occupied mean in this sentence? That's key. Occupied means a couple of different things, but we wanna know what does it mean in this passage? So let's look at our answers. A, to have held a position or an office. So you think about a, a position like occupation. Well, that's more related to jobs. I don't think we're talking about jobs here. I think we're out in nature. So I don't think it's A. B, to have taken or filled up space, time, etc. Well, it does say spot, like a spot in, in the grass. So I like B, let's keep it, but let's keep going. Letter C, to have been a resident or tenant of or to have dwelt in. Well, maybe you say the word dwelt. That's a weird word. Doesn't really matter if we know what it means, but maybe we do recognize the word resident. Resident means uh, someone who lives there. So we're not really talking about his house. Like I said, we're out in nature. So I don't think it's letter C, where you live. Letter D, to have taken possession or control of a place as by military invasion. Was there any talk of military invasion or violence or fighting or anything? I didn't read that, so I think it's pretty easy to mark off D as well, which just leaves us with answer B, that space that he occupied. He was in that space and he's slowly moving from it. So let's check our answers. And we are correct, it is B. All right. Question four, we've got a new passage. So again, note all the pages here. One, two, three, four, read them all. Don't skip any of them. So let's look at our title here. We have excerpt from Anne of Green Gables. Excerpt just means a, a short reading. It's not the whole book, it's just a piece of it. And the book is called Anne of Green Gables. Okay, so you know it's gonna be like a short story, um, maybe fiction. So again, I would take time and I would read through all four of these pages. I've already done that. So now I'm ready for the questions. In this excerpt, Anne asks Marilla to call her Cordelia. What does this request reveal about Anne? So she does want to go by a different name and that is Cordelia. So let's take a look in the passage here. It starts on page three. She says, what's your name? Will you please call me Cordelia? call you Cordelia? Is that your name? And then we go to page four and we see her start to get into why she wants to be called Cordelia. Well, it's an elegant name, right? She says, um, Anne, her real name is so unromantic. And she's always imagined that her name was Cordelia. So what does this say about this girl? A, she tries to make her life more interesting. Well, I like that. I think she is trying to make herself more interesting. She says, Anne, oh, that's a boring name. I want something more elegant, something more romantic like Cordelia. So I think A is a good answer, but let's make sure it's the best answer. Letter B, she wishes she could fit in better with her peers. 
Now that word peers just means her, her people her age, her classmates, her friends, the people that she's around. I don't see that in this, in this passage. She's not talking about her friends or her classmates, so I don't think she's worried about fitting in. In fact, trying to change your name might make her stick out a little bit. Let her see. She feels confused about her own past. Um, maybe, but I don't have any evidence of that confusion. She's a little different for sure, but I don't see confused. Letter D, she hesitates to share personal details. Uh, I think that's the opposite. I think she's very open. She, she goes on this long explanation of, oh, Anne, that's such a boring name. I love Cordelia. She's very open with why she wants to change her name. So therefore, I think the answer has to be A. She wants to be more interesting. Cordelia is a, a better name, she thinks. So let's check our answers. And we are correct, it is letter A. All right, question five. And as you can see, I've already done this one. So let me reset those answers and I'll tell you how I came up with that. So this is a drag and drop um, and it's order of events. It says drag and drop the events into the chart to show the order in which they occur in the excerpt. So the story starts out on page one uh, he comes home with a little girl instead of a little boy. And they're like, well, what happened? I'm like, well, she was there. She was the only one there. So Matthew is explaining her presence, why she is there instead of the little boy. And then we keep going. Um, and then it says, well, well, there's no need to cry about it. So Marilla tells Anne not to cry. And then she says, You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. So she decides Anne can stay for the night. And then they start talking about the name. What is your name? Cordelia. Is that your real name? No, but you know, I like Cordelia better. It's a perfectly elegant name. Anne, ugh, how unromantic. So Anne explains why she prefers a different name. We'll check our answers. And there we go, right there. So again, just kind of walk through the reading and figure out which one happened first, second, third, and fourth. Question six is also a drag and drop. And again, I've already done it. So let's walk through it together. It says drag and drop each word that describes Anne into the character web. So this is what we call a web where you have the main idea in the middle, Anne, and then you have three bubbles outside of it that are going to describe Anne. So let's take a look at our options. We have dramatic, oh yes. Anne is very dramatic. You look at um, how she responds. You don't want me, right? For a child to scream that, you know they're pretty dramatic. If they're, they're over the top, they're yelling all these things. Um, you go back to the thing with the name that she wants to change. All right, the next one is practical. Uh, I would not describe Anne as practical, right? She's over the top, she's very dramatic. She doesn't like her name, it's boring, so she wants to go by Cordelia. Not the most practical child. Satisfied, is she happy? Is she okay with what's going on? No, not in the least. Um, she's talking about, you would cry too if you were an orphan. Eh, I don't think Anne's the most happy child right now. Enthusiastic, yes. She's very enthusiastic. When she starts talking about her name, the name Cordelia that she loves, she's very excited about it, very enthusiastic. And the last one, disappointed. She's very disappointed a couple of times where she says, oh, you don't want me. Or when she's crying, you would cry too if you were an orphan and had to come to a place you thought was going to be home and found out they didn't want you. Yeah, she's disappointed. So those are three words that we could use to describe the character of Anne in this reading. Dramatic, enthusiastic, and disappointed. Let's check our answers, and we are correct. All right, next question. Question seven is a little different. Uh, you see it's an email, but there's a few questions within it. So we have to click that arrow here where it says select, and they're gonna give us some answer options. This is what we call a drop-down box. So we need to complete the sentences in this email so that it makes sense. So what you wanna do with this is you wanna go ahead and read it. The passage below is incomplete. Navigate to each select button and choose the option that correctly completes the sentences. So we have the introduction, dear Miss Gardner. 
And what you would want to do is start at the beginning and just read through it. So I've already read it, so I'm going to go ahead and skip down to the questions. And what I want to do when I get to the questions is slow down and read the sentence before and after it. So I would say the speed and power of our Skyview products have been blank. Just last week, however, our laptop began to freeze. So let's look at our options here. And what we want to do is include it within the passage. So again, the speed and power of our Skyview products have been blank. And what I notice about these four answers is that they're, they're all very similar. They all start with the word outstanding and then have some information about well-suited after it. The big difference here that I see immediately is no punctuation, period, comma, period. So we need to figure out probably which punctuation is correct in this sentence. So let's start at this bottom one here. The speed and power of our Skyview products have been outstanding, always well suited to our needs. What is well suited to our needs? There's no subject in that sentence, so it can't be the last one. All right, what about this one? Outstanding, comma, they are always well suited to our needs. Well, now this one does have a subject. What is well suited? They, they are, the products. But that's a complete sentence by itself. They are always well suited to our needs. Subject, verb, makes sense, can stand alone. So I don't think the comma is correct here. I think that should be a period for a new sentence. So this one here, outstanding period. Your products are always well suited to our needs. Complete sentence, check, period, check. I like that one, but we're not finished. Let's make sure. Outstanding, your products are always well suited to our needs. No punctuation. Well, I think that's kind of a run on because you have the complete idea. Your products are always well suited to our needs. It needs to be separated from the other sentence. So let's choose the one that has the period and the clear subject, your products. All right, let's try the next one. Again, we're gonna keep reading all the way through. And then we're gonna slow down when we get to the next question. I called Skyview again this morning, blank. The representative with whom I eventually spoke directed, to, directed me to take our laptop to a repair facility 30 miles from our home. Let's figure out what sentence goes in between those. So the first one says, the phone call lasted about 20 minutes asking for help with my problem. Who's asking for help? The phone call? No. There's no subject. I don't know who is asking. All right, the second one. Asking for help with my problem, the phone call lasted about 20 minutes. Again, who's asking? I don't like it. The phone call lasted about 20 minutes as I asked for help with my problem. Who's asking? I am. This one is clear. I asked for help. I like it, but let's check the last one. Asking for help on the phone call about my problem lasted about 20 minutes. Again, who is asking for help? It does not say you need a subject. So it has to be this third one. Keep going. We are also disappointed that we had to blank before we learn the truth of our situation. Let's take a look. Make six phone calls, two emails, and doing our own research. Now here's the problem. The verbs in this sentence make, and doing. They're different forms. Make, present tense. Doing, I-N-G, those are different. We don't want two different verbs like that in two different forms in the same sentence. So I don't like that one. Um, we were disappointed we had to have made six phone calls, two emails, and our own research. Do we say that? Make our own research? Or do we say do our own research? I say do. I don't think we say make our own research. So I think there needs to be a different verb in front of our own research. So I don't like that one. Next one, we're disappointed that we had to make six phone calls, write two emails and do our own research. So our verbs, make, write, do. They're all present tense, they're all regular form, nothing special, nothing different, nothing fancy. So I like that, I like that they're all in the same form and they all make sense, I like it. But let's check the last one just in case. 
We were also disappointed that we had to be making six phone calls, writing two emails, and researching on our own. We had to be making, I don't think we need that word be. B doesn't make sense there. Let's keep it simple. Choose this one. Make, write, do. And finally, our last one. If our laptop has problems with, which makes it unusable, Skyview should immediately replace it with one that works with as little inconvenience to blank as possible. It, us, him, both. So who is being inconvenienced here? Who has the problem? Well, it's this man at the bottom of the email, Mr. James Hendricks. Now, James is talking. He is the one that is speaking in this email. So if he were talking about himself and his problems, how would he describe that? What would he use? So again, our options, would he call himself it? No. Would he call himself us? Well, that might make sense if he's talking about him and his family. Would he call himself him? Him inconvenient or inconvenience to him. Not if he's talking about himself. I wouldn't say her, I would say I, talking about me. That doesn't make sense. Both. Little inconvenience to both. Both what? That's not finished. I think it's us. So now you can check it by reading the whole sentence. With as little inconvenience to us as possible. Does that make sense? Is that how we would talk? Yes, it is. Very good. So we can check our answers here and we see that they are uh, correct for each drop down box. All right, moving on, question eight. So anytime you get a reading and you see a picture, pay attention to it, it's important. So the title here we have, article one, a summary of Harry S. Truman's 1947 speech on civil rights. Couple of things jump out to me. I see Harry S. Truman. Maybe you know who he is, maybe you don't. I know he was a president. 1947, okay, so we're getting an idea of time. Speech on civil rights. Now, when I think of civil rights, I think uh, Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights movement. So we're talking about rights, uh, specifically of African Americans, all right? We look at the picture here. Now the picture, I see a man and a woman. I'm gonna guess that the man is probably this Harry S. Truman. The woman, maybe you know who she is, Maybe you don't, it doesn't matter. There's a description at the bottom. It says, Eleanor Roosevelt speaks with President Harry S. Truman, president, so if you didn't know, now you do, in May of 1951. She is reporting on her work as a delegate of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. So we see that Eleanor is an important woman. Maybe you recognize that name Roosevelt. Her husband was president. Um, but even if you didn't know that, you can tell she's someone important. If she's giving a speech on her work with the United Nations Human Rights Commission, sounds like she's an important person. So we want to take a look at the title, the pictures, and the captions, and the pages. So Article 1 is a summary of his speech. So we see his speech here. And then page 4, it, it changes. Now we have Article 2 a discussion of Eleanor Roosevelt's 1948 speech on human rights. So there's two different speeches here, but they're both talking about that idea of human rights or civil rights. So there is a connection between the two speeches. And again, we're gonna take the time to read all five pages, but I've already done that, so I'm ready for my questions. President Truman mentioned the United Nations Commission on Human Rights during his speech to the NAACP in order to show. Now I'm gonna highlight that phrase, in order to show. That phrase is asking me why. For what reason did he include that information? What was his purpose? Why did he do it? So I like to take a look at where that is in the speech. And if he goes through, and I believe it's on page three here, yes. United Nations Commission on human rights. So it's in paragraph four. So let's take a look at our answers here. A, how civil rights legislation worked outside of the United States. Well, outside the United States, that's true. United Nations, nations being countries. So it's a group of countries working together. So maybe, let's leave it. B, 
his general support of the civil rights in the United States and abroad. So in the United States and outside the United States. Also, I like it, we'll leave it. Letter C, how the United States has learned valuable civil rights lessons from other countries. So we're learning from other countries. Um, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see lessons being taught. He talks about it, but I'm not sure that we're teaching or we're learning from other countries. Letter D, his belief that the United States had civil rights policies that should be adopted by other countries. So now the United States is teaching other countries. Again, I, I don't see that process of teaching, teaching lessons of how, how things are done. Um, one way or the other, who's teaching who? It does not really talk about it. Therefore, I cannot say that C or D is, is a correct answer. So now I've narrowed it down to A and B. It's how civil rights legislation worked and his general support of civil rights. So if we look at this paragraph and the whole speech, how civil rights legislation worked. Legislation is laws. Does it really explain in detail how these laws work or does he just talk about them? I think he just talks about them. I don't think he's telling me the process of how it works. But B, general support. Very open, just kind of saying, here it is, here's what it's about. I think that's what he's talking about. I think he's giving his general support for it. In this speech, he is recognizing it and, and describing it. That's it. So general support seems like a good answer. So let's check it and we are correct. It is letter B. All right, question nine. What approach did Eleanor Roosevelt take to encourage acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Now, one thing to note, there's our Eleanor Roosevelt. So speech number one here is by Harry S. Truman, not Eleanor Roosevelt. So I can actually jump to page four here to really focus on her speech rather than his. And that narrows it down a little bit. So her acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we see that she talks about that here, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she also talks about it, I believe, on the next page here, which I'm gonna have to clear. So paragraph nine is the one to really pay attention to with this question. So let's look at our answer options. Letter A, she suggested that nations in disagreement with her stance be removed from the commission. So if you don't like it, you should leave. I don't see that. She doesn't talk about that. She talks about the differences and how there are different countries with different views, but she doesn't talk about kicking them out for it. So it can't be A. Letter B, she warned of the problems that would occur if all nations had different civil rights policies within their borders. So there's problems. Okay, well, let's take a look. So she does talk about the United States and compares it to the Soviet Union, which is now what we call Russia. So there's problems. They are, they do have different views on civil rights between these two countries. So it talks about the differences in, in not punishing expressions of political viewpoints versus closing down any papers that criticize the government. That's the difference between the United States and Russia. But she doesn't really talk about the problems that would happen just because they have different viewpoints or the countries have different ways of handling it. She just states that this is how they handle it. Let her see. She acknowledged the difficulty of convincing different nations to agree on the common ideas of democracy and power. So let's clear these out and let's look at C. So she acknowledges the differences and the difficulties. So she actually does describe the difficulties in deciding upon universal definitions for the bill's conception of democracy. That sounds pretty close to me. Let's leave it. But let's look at C or D. D, she compared the abstaining nations with the voting nations and suggested that the differences between them were insignificant. Two words to note here. First one, abstaining. Second one, insignificant. Now, the word abstaining appears in the reading here. It says four nations abstained from a vote. Maybe you know the word abstain, but maybe you don't. That's okay, we can figure it out. Whenever we have a word, 
that has this a or ab to begin with, it means not. So they did not do something with a vote, comparing them to the nations who did vote. So you can probably guess it means they didn't vote. All right, and they are insignificant. The, the differences between them are insignificant, meaning they don't matter. So does she say the difference between countries don't matter? Or does she draw out the comparison between the two countries? I think she draws big comparisons and is showing specifically how they are different and saying it is a problem. It does create some issues. Therefore, I don't think it can be D. Insignificant? No, it's very significant. And so that leaves us with answer C. She acknowledges that these differences um, make it difficult. Let's clear and let's check. And we are correct. It is option C. Very good. And so that does wrap us up. The only thing remaining is the essay, which we'll talk about in a different video. So remember, the link to this practice test will be in the description of the video. So try it for yourself. See what you do. We'll see you later.